Okay, so welcome everyone, both our virtual people and our people in the room. As usual, um, there are people here from Axia. I'm going to go around and ask them to just introduce themselves very briefly. Evie is our data analyst and learning and development manager. Um, Esme is an assistant psychologist. Este is our head of therapy and lots of other things. Khalil, member of our admin team. Chloe, assistant psychologist. Bev, PA to myself and Calvin, thank goodness, and facilities manager. Elliot, who is one of the anime amigos, part of, our nerd, yeah, part of our nerd consultancy. Then we've got Ren, who's a diagnostician and also an anime amigo and a nerd consultancy. Calvin, my son, who is co-director, Anime Amigos, Film Society, et cetera, et cetera. Amy, who is admin assistant to the senior management team. Dream, who is our IT guy, whatever IT is, as per his detail on our website. And then our newest member is Joe, who is has joined us as our on-site um, IT technician and um, maintenance engineer. Okay. Are you still with us, Carly? Yeah, I didn't know who froze then, if it was me or you, so I just waited. <laughs> so, well, I'm, we might overrun today um, because we want to make maximum opportunity for Carly to speak with us, but also I've got some exciting developments that I'd like to share. We totally understand if everyone goes at two, that's when it's meant to end. If we do overrun and you want to stay either virtually or face to face, please feel free to do so. The only ground rule we have is respect. So as long as we all respect each other and how we manage these situations, that's fine. That's the only ground rule. So I'd like to introduce Carly, um, Carly Jones, MBE. And as I said to Carly before, we'd be here for the whole two hours if I told you about all her achievements, which are absolutely wonderful, including this book around safeguarding, which I would urge any of you who are at all interested in safeguarding, particularly women and girls. But actually, as the book says, it applies to every person. Um, Luke, our mate Luke, who you may have seen last night on Chris Packham's wonderful programme, our mate Luke's done the four words and it is a beautiful description of you, Carly, from what I remember of you as well at the AAS Awards. Just a very, I know you've told me not to say anything, but I'm going to say something. So you're an autism advocate, keynote speaker, presenter, author. You've also been involved in quite a lot of UK policy work around safeguarding. Um, you've also, if people haven't heard of the Oliver McGowan uh, training, then again, I urge you to look into that. And, and Carly's been spearheading a lot of that. And you've received the accolade of an MBA for your pioneering work around diagnosis, education, and safeguarding of autistic women, girls, and their families. Now, your title is Autistic Spice, Born to be Mild. Don't worry, Calvin, I'm not going to start singing. Thank you. Um, so I'm now going to hand over then to you, Carly, and thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Linda and Evie and all, thank you so much for inviting me into this. Um, it's it's an absolute. I, I just saw someone write Noro spicy. I love that. That's a good. That's a good title. I might have to borrow that from you. I'll credit you. No. Yeah. Cheers, Carly. Thank you. Um, yeah, really, really grateful to be here. And thank you for the lovely introduction. It makes me sound like I've had a really lovely life, doesn't it? So I'm about to burst that bubble and talk about safeguarding and abuse. Sorry, everyone. Um, not, not a very cheerful subject, but hopefully we'll we'll get it through it together without uh, without it being too, too traumatic together um, in person. So um, so yes, introduction there, you can see some photos on that first slide. Um, that's that's my family. You can see a very glamorous photo of me at approximately 10 years of age with uh, with my very funky red uh, red spectacles on, um, which I would probably describe as the pre-masking stage of my life. Um, I've got a, also a photo there of my family. So I didn't know I was autistic until well, I knew in my late 20s, but um, 
but I wasn't diagnosed until I was 32 years of age. That diagnosis was Asperger's syndrome, but I just refer to myself as autistic. That came about because, um, well, many, many vulnerabilities in life, but um, the reason I could kind of figure out why life had been such a challenge um, was two of my daughters were diagnosed as being autistic at one when they were six and one when they were about two, um, which obviously was very early diagnoses, particularly for girls and particularly back then because they're much older now um, and, uh, you know, kind of moved out living with partners that sort of age. So it was a long time ago. Um, and, uh, and when I got their diagnosis, diagnosis is I um it, it was a, a real relief but also um I, I then started to try and google everything that I could find probably got into special interest which I was now been a special interest for probably 15 16 years um anything I could find about autistic women and girls and back then that unless somebody had um perhaps an additional learning disability um, there wasn't very much out there about autistic women and girls, even on the internet. But what I did find was um, was like somebody had watched my life from birth, taken minutes, and then shoved those minutes and actions onto the internet for me to find in in adulthood. So it was um, it, it was it was quite scary actually. Um, it was scary because people didn't actually believe me apart from the doctors, thankfully, people didn't actually believe me that I had autistic daughters, one educational professional, which I say in the loosest of terms, made one of my daughters wear a dunce hat at school. It was genuinely a dunce hat. It was, I read a bit of card stapled together, said, I will be polite to everyone I meet on it because um, she wouldn't give eye contact uh, and was made to wear that all school day, break times, lunch times, even to the pickup. So obviously I took her out of that school. So that was really scary. And another another educational professional said, only boys are autistic. It's impossible that you have two autistic daughters. I thought I was lying. So then to realise that I actually was autistic too was very scary, particularly then as a, I know I had three children by the time I was 25, divorced by 25. And, uh, and I was really worried if I kind of said to people oh I, I think I'm autistic too I'd like to get a diagnosis then then you know they were going to call social services or something on me I was really really scared so it was scary for that reason but it was also scary because I um I kind of realized when learning more about being autistic and and how that can make us quite vulnerable in social situations relationships friendships I, I kind of realized that lots of the negative uh, situations I'd had as a, as a young woman were likely, likely A, because some people aren't very nice, but also likely because I, I was autistic and didn't really know how to navigate social situations or get out of um, toxic or unhealthy situations. So, uh, so that might, I, I became very, very scared basically because I thought, well, if this is because of this thing called autism um, and my daughters are also autistic, are they going to have the same life trajectory as me? Are they going to experience the same vulnerabilities? So, um, so that's why I started campaigning uh, back, back then to, to get more awareness and safeguarding for autistic women and girls. Um, because I just think love and fear are really big drivers and um, and I had to learn everything I could and do as many uh, kind of jobs as I could to um, to try to try and make things better. So people would often say I'm going on to for anyone that's got the slides in front of them now I'm going on to the slide that says why does a diagnosis matter for the mild? I say mild in the loosest of terms because um, does uh, you know, if somebody appears to be clinically mild, does that mean that they have a mild life uh, experience? No, actually. Um, I did a, did a survey. Um, when was it? 20, before I went to the United Nations. So 2014, 2015-ish. And, um, and I asked the autistic community before diagnosis um, um, and, and support, had you experienced any form of abuse? And 91% of autistic uh, adults said yes before diagnosis they had encountered some some form of abuse. 
Uh, and I thought, oh, that's a bit subjective. It was just an informal, you know, I'm not a researcher, I'm not an academic. It's just an informal kind of survey monkey survey that I'd done on social media. And I thought, well, because I'm talking about autism a lot and lots of my kind of Facebook friends or Twitter friends, followers, whatever you call them, um, were autistic. I thought maybe that's a bit, that's a bit subjective and it's not going to be that high. But I took that stat with me to the UN anyway. Um, and unfortunately, I, you know, I'd kind of really hoped that that wasn't the right statistic. Um, but, but unfortunately, I was in Dundee, uh, 9th of September last year. And I was, I was working with the incredible Dr. Katrina Stewart, who is just awesome. If, if I'm sure many people have heard of her. One um, in Scotland, Scottish Women's Autism Network. But anyway, we were in Dundee doing some work on um, kind of uh, gender-based violence uh, and autistic women. And uh, there was a speaker there from, I think it could have been Women's Age, one of the domestic violence refugee, refuge, I would say, refugees not refugees I always get my words mixed up apologies um and they said for every 10 women that they're supporting and this is broadly they support anyone not just autistic women but for every 10 women they're supporting fleeing from domestic violence nine of them are autistic so that's again that 90 percent and then more recently I found some French research research from France and it was again the 90 90 percent so we've got a real kind of silent, urgent emergency for safeguarding there. So our, our diagnosis levels have skyrocketed, but actually our safeguarding of autistic women, girls and boys and, and non-binary, um, we're not there yet. We need to do more to safeguard. So I don't believe that a clinically mild diagnosis is ever mild. Also, if we think about, you know, there are days where I can be incredibly verbal um, and I might come across as very high functioning, but there are also days that's that's kind of based on the environment and by environment, I mean, not just sensory, but emotionally as well. There are days where I can be completely nonverbal um, and really need much higher support. So I don't think that we're ever fixed somewhere on the spectrum or however you'd like to describe it anyway. But there is a problem with being believed um, so I'm looking at my slides on my phone. There is a problem with being believed. Um, as you can see, I won't read it out because it's being recorded, but I, I do get some lovely fan mail. <laughs> um, this one, oh, actually, I will read it out. Um, you're an ugly fake. Oh, there's a swear word there, so I've blocked it out. Um, basically, a uh, swear word. Do you have autism? You have a personality disorder. Bit autistic society don't realise you're a something something with an embarrassing past something something so I, I I still get messages like that um of people not believing me that I'm autistic and that would have really hurt me many years ago but it doesn't now I just screenshot them and then use them for presentations to prove my point so it's quite helpful actually hate mail um but uh but yeah the the diagnosis does matter regardless of of how someone's autism present we, we need access to support now really important that people know under the equalities act 2010 a uh, any reasonable adjustments be that in education be that in uh, the workplace be that in healthcare anything really um is is needs led not diagnosis led so even if you didn't have your diagnosis but you had needs uh, for reasonable adjustments under the Equalities Act, that's that you're protected. Um, I think a lot of time people aren't aware of that. Um, so you should, should in theory, we all know it never happens, but should in theory still get that support because you're covered by that legislation of the Equalities Act 2010. But the diagnosis certainly helps, doesn't it? Because nine times out of ten, people want they want proof, they want the evidence. They're not going to believe us anyway half the time. Um, so, and sometimes parents as well particularly if they're quite wealthy, parents will say to me, well, um, they don't need any support with perhaps disability benefits. They don't need any support with the educational system because they can afford to have one person stay at home, home educate or send them to a private school with like four kids in the class. And they're in the same building for like 18 years. Why on earth would they label their child? Um, am I, and you know, in many cases they're right actually, but it, they're wrong on because we're autistic forever. We don't suddenly turn 18 and then we aren't autistic. 
So I always pose the question in a healthcare setting. It's really important that the health professionals that are looking after um, an autistic person know they're autistic. And what about if they, you know, most people at some point in their lives will end up in court. They could be a victim, could be a witness, could be a defendant. And if those questions aren't tweaked and asked, particularly in kind of legal fact finding um, for, for, for an autistic person, then, then that's going to, they're not going to get a fair trial. So it's really important that people know that, first of all, they know they're autistic and also the people supporting them or perhaps not supporting them and trying to put them in jail know that they're autistic as well. So that's super, super important to safeguard us. Kind of that sense of self. I don't know. I, I you know, I appreciate that I'm talking to many people that have perhaps just got, you know, some post-diagnostic support group. So um, I don't know if people feel the same way, or maybe I'm just talking about myself here. But but for me, uh, my diagnosis gave me my sense of self because I've been masking so long, um, you know, decades. Uh, I kind of forgot who I was. I was just trying to appease everyone else, and <clears throat> excuse me, trying to. Um, blend in, fit in, survive rather than thriving, living on remotes, um, just trying to keep safe. And, uh, and that sense of self that I got after my diagnosis and realizing, um, you know, it was okay that I thought differently and, and perhaps perceived things differently. And oh, that's why, you know, I might have not understood somebody else's agendas. It, it really helped me rebuild. And uh, I wouldn't say I'm completely there yet because, you know, if you've been masking for 32 years and then, uh, you know, I'm only, I'm just kind of 41 now. It's, you know, it's at the, the masking time outweighs the unmasking time, I guess. But, um, but that, that certainly helps. I think everyone deserves to kind of know, know their identity on that one. Um, and family understanding as well. Um, I, think, I think that can be a really good thing particularly if there have been strained family relationships historically um, or, or even if things have been great just for people to for there to be a name for it and something that they can look up um, rather than having to constantly have to explain your needs or explain what how, how life can be a bit different for you that can be good and obviously as we all know uh, autism is very very likely genetic so what what you might find <laughs> is that uh, Many of family members will also, uh, you know, feel free to, to open up and, and talk about either relatives that, that they suspected were autistic or are autistic um, or even themselves. So I think it can bring a bit of family cohesion sometimes. And even if it isn't cohesion, it, um, it, it can certainly help breed some understanding there. I feel really rude because I'm looking at my phone for the slides. I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, and to mitigate misdiagnosis. So uh, many autistic women and men I've supported tend to get diagnosed um, with a mental health condition prior, to, uh, prior to, to the autism diagnosis. Now we know autism isn't a mental health condition, but we also know that autistic people can also have um, a mental health condition on top, normally because of um, just how complicated life is and, and also a bit quite traumatic. Uh, you know, there can be quite a lot of trauma there and, and quite a lot of post-traumatic stress actually, either from one big event or lots and lots of tiny events which have accumulated over our lives. So, um, so it, but it can mitigate misdiagnosis because many people are supported have been incorrectly medicated and incorrectly diagnosed um, with something else which you might think oh well what's the problem with that well apart from the being medicated with the wrong stuff but <clears throat> when it comes to particularly women um perhaps in courts perhaps in family law custody battles those sort of things um it, it, you often find that inaccurate diag misdiagnosis of mental health conditions can get pulled up and and in a way to kind of be used against them which is which is wrong so it's it's not oil and water, but but it certainly is uh, something which a diagnosis can can help us reframe and, and perhaps the professionals that look after us reframe and reconsider. Is this a trait of, you know, is this a symptom of a mental health condition or is this a trait of autism and kind of putting two different pairs of glasses on to, to get to get to the bottom of it. Um, and kind of knowing our rights as well. Knowing our rights is very important. So. 
I, at this point, I'd normally say next slide, but I, I'm not. I'm just going to say uh, do it myself. It's um, you're just going to see the picture now where I've put uh, it actually got a, it's like a thermometer, but it's got a, from mild to hellfire. Um, so instead of talking about kind of mild to severe, mild to hellfire of how we might be experiencing the world that day. Um, today is pretty much a bell pepper day, if you can see on that one. So I'm, I'm feeling not quite as autistic spicy or noro spicy because I'm at home and I'm in I'm in my haven. I'm in my comfort area. I've got a nice pair of jogging bottoms on and a smart top because that's what I do when I'm working from home. <laughs> so I don't actually put my work trousers on. Who does that? <laughs> that's crazy. Um, but there is there, you know, there are photos there to show days where it can be good. Um, or, or perceived to be out to the outside world that things are going good a picture of being very very dressed up um, and then there's a photo there completely unmasked in hospital with my with my friend who was looking after me because I was having some treatment and I really needed that kind of one-to-one -one support so it can it, it can be very very different uh, and also being autistic is is a hidden disability so on that slide you can also see that there's a sunflower lanyard which I tie to to my handbag handle i've just got like a little like a pin badgy one as well now it's like a little ribbon looks like a charity ribbon uh, on and i can put that on my work coat as well which came in really really good handy actually on friday when i was trying to get home from london um, from work and uh, and i need to sit into one of the disabled seats and i felt really guilty um but uh, i don't know why i felt guilty i just did but that the sunflower lanyard helps with that and also there's autism alert cards you can get as well, which can be quite helpful. So the next slide I'm going to go on to is the one about social imagination. <clears throat> so um, what it is and what it isn't really. Sometimes, and I'm sure everyone in this room's heard this because I'm preaching to the choir, but sometimes people um, can say, oh, you know, but you like to write books or you like to write scripts or you're good at poetry or you really like acting or X, Y, Z uh, or you're really good at art. I'm not very good at art, by the way. I can just about draw a stick man. Um, but uh, and they go, oh, you've got tons and tons of imagination. You can't possibly be autistic. But we know so many autistic people are, are phenomenal in, in artistic careers. Um, but that so imagination of understanding in this situation if someone says this I say that what could happen next that kind of consequences which makes us sound doesn't it like we're a bit um we, we're a bit of a vulnerability <laughs> we, 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 we like to take risk but I don't think many of us do because uh, we're quite rule driven and quite like routine but it, but actually it makes us quite vulnerable because we might not be able to foresee as well. Now I'm hypothesizing because I've always been autistic and I'll always be autistic. So I don't know what it's like not to be autistic, but I'm imagining, not with my social imagination, with my traditional imagination, I'm imagining that other people that aren't autistic have a better understanding of what could happen next socially. But I um, I really, really, really struggle with that. So I tend to live my life by making lots and lots of mistakes and then remembering the mistakes. So just have a quick drink. Always Diet Coke. I don't know if anyone else here loves Diet Coke, but um, somebody who diagnoses autism said to me, every time an autistic person comes in, they've always got a fizzy drink and it's normally Diet Coke. So I'm afraid. I am, I am quite stereotypical in that <laughs> way anyway. So yeah, our social imagination can make us quite vulnerable and it's hard. <laughs> Obsessed with Diet Coke, yay. <laughs> I'm not sponsored by Diet Coke, by the way, but um, the amount I go through cannot be good for me. Um, it, it can make it difficult to ask for help because uh, if you think about it, help is an advantageous consequence. So if we, first of all, we need to know what's happening is wrong and I'd like it to stop. So that's our first challenge. And then we need to understand because I know what's happening is wrong and I'd like it to stop. Uh, I don't know if anyone else has this issue, but I tend to prefer, um, I, I tend to think that other people know what's in my mind. <laughs> so I will often kind of get a text message and reply in my head, but then actually forget to text someone back because I've just replied in my head, so it's done. 
I, you know, I know, so everyone knows. Um, and it, it's very frustrating for people, particularly my adult daughters. Um, so that's, I struggle with that. So if something's upset me or if, if I need some help or, or there could be a dangerous situation, I would just assume that everyone knows because I know. So that's not good. So then once I figured that out that I need to communicate, I think that might be why I overshare as well. I overshare A because I haven't got any filter, but B also because then if I've just told everyone, everyone does know. Um, be good, bad, happy, indifferent. Um, and, and then once you've told someone else, you then have to understand that if I ask for help with that situation, that has an advantageous consequence, which uses up a lot of not only brain power, but it uses up a lot of um, social imagination, which I struggle with. So I think for autistic people, asking for help can be an absolute minefield um, and, and something I'm getting better at. But it's not, I'm only better at it because I know I'm autistic. And I know I struggle with it. Otherwise, I just think everyone does that. Um, a good little thing, actually, whilst I'm just talking about the fact that I assume everything that's in my brain is in other people's brains. Um, I've always assumed that anything I could do, be it academically or professionally, or perhaps a skill or a talent, I've always assumed that absolutely everyone else knows that information, everyone else can do that. So then if I saw someone doing something which I couldn't do, I'd assume that they could do that on top of all of those other things. And someone once said to me, which I thought was really kind, they said, well, you know, some of the things that you do, not everyone can do that. I'm like, of course they know that, but they don't. So give so that that's that's quite good for self esteem to know that, because um, because you kind of think to yourself oh that is something I knew that somebody else didn't know, so uh, so it can make us vulnerable but it can also kind of ruin our self esteem a bit I think sometimes, so learning that was was helpful. Going back to my slides, sorry my phone keeps um, going onto screensaver, um, which is why I'm uh, flagging a bit there. So the next, oh gosh, this is, um, this is quite, um, not I don't actually get embarrassed because I'd have to imagine that somebody else has a different idea about the situation to me. So I don't actually get embarrassed, which, which can be awkward. So not embarrassing, but it's funny. And I have got permission from my friend for this slide to share it. So taking things at face value um, or, or literally also being face blind. So I'll go on to the face blind one in a minute. But basically, you'll see here a screenshot of conversations. <laughs> I made a friend online called Georgie. And um, the picture of Georgie was a man and a woman. Um, they were very dressed up. They looked like they were going out for the night or something. But I made friends with Georgie online talking about autism. And I was really interested by Georgie because Georgie not only um, was autistic, but also deaf. And I'm really fascinated slash um, super uh, special interested in the intersections of disability so somebody that's perhaps blind and autistic or deaf and autistic because I think a we don't know and know enough people aren't talking about it as much and also they tend to get diagnosed either blind or deaf at, you know birth onwards but not autistic until they're perhaps like 30 40 50 even so I said to Georgie I said I'd really like you to come and do some um, autism advocacy work with me um, I need to, would you, A, would you like to do it? And B, um, I'm going to, I need a photo to send to this particular place. So I said, can I use this photo? You look beautiful in this dress. <laughs> um, but, but actually for six months, I'd been talking to, it was Georgie. It's just, it was the man in the picture. Cause I just, just took it as face value that that's who it was. And for six months, I didn't think to question it. Um, and it was very, very funny. And Georgie and I work on a lot of boards and things now, but it's, um, it's brilliant. So yeah, the best friend I never had really <laughs> had no idea. So, and I thought to myself, well, that's quite funny as a, you know, middle-aged woman, that's quite funny. But, uh, but if I was a, perhaps a 14 year old girl or a 16 year old boy and kind of, just assuming whoever taking things at face value not asking enough questions just assuming my knowledge is fact um that could be quite that could be quite dangerous couldn't it um and, and being face blind there's a word for it that I can't pronounce because I'm terrible at pronouncing words I'm terrible at rem remembering names so Linda I love the fact that your t-shirts have your names on if we could just make that law so everywhere in life people have to have a t-shirt their names on that would be awesome I was out at the weekend and I introduced a friend of mine to another friend of mine and, and completely got all the names wrong but I think people are used to me doing that now um, and face blindness I oh gosh so there are some which are quite 
oh, how do I describe it? There are some which are quite awkward, but not too bad. So uh, I once went to the theatre. I had a friend there that had black curly hair and he always wore check shirts. So I walk into the theatre cafe. You know, it's like at the theatre, you hug and you kiss on each cheek and all that malarkey. And uh, so I did this and uh, it was completely the wrong person. It was just another person that had black curly hair and a checked shirt. Um, I mean, I'm divorced now, but I can remember it being, was it Millennium Night or the or the New Year's after that? Anyway, it was New Year's Eve. And I said to my then husband, I said, please don't buy this shirt to wear tonight. It was like, I don't know if you remember these, where you used to get like the black shirts with the white collars and the white cuffs and everyone wore them. I think like a boy band of the Millennium had made them quite uh, quite fashionable so everyone I said just just please everyone's going to be wearing that and I think he thought I was being a bit snobby or something um, um and he's like no no that's a shirt I'm buying that shirt I want to wear I was like okay then so it gets to midnight where you're supposed to kiss everyone because it's used to see in the new year I was kissing completely the wrong person because he had the same shirt on so I didn't know I was autistic then I didn't know I was face blind then it's just a really awkward situation I've got myself into I haven't got any better in fact I've got worse the other day I was picking up my um, teenager from college um, and they all wear the same baggy trousers, don't they? And hoodies and caps and everything. We've all got the same bag and all that. Anyway, I tried to get the wrong child into my car. So that could have been that could have been dodgy. It definitely looked dodgy. I had to apologise to the parents and everything going, I'm so sorry. I thought it was my child. So never trust me to pick up your kids from school because I will bring the wrong one home. So face blindness can be really really tricky for me and I, I I do try to to try and I don't, don't really know how to make it better but I think it explains a lot of particularly for people of autistic children you know why they might not like uh you know book day where people are I mean people are in fancy dress or might find birthday parties difficult one of mine found birthday parties difficult because they went at school they went in a uniform the hair looks different and I have no idea who anyone at their party was. So name badges are brilliant, which is probably why the only time I leave the house is conferences, because everybody's got, got their name badge on and I know who they are and I know who they work for. So I can remember where I last saw them as well. So that's handy. But we just need to make that law, really. So well done on your T-shirts there. So talking about jobs, <laughs> gaining employment um, to make us safe. And to, uh, we need to have some financial independence, I think. I think that's really important, um, not just for women, but people in general. And we know that autistic people can really struggle with either gaining employment, staying in employment, um, or being treated and, uh, and given the right environment in employment. So application forms can be a nightmare, as we all know. Um, it's really hard for us also to kind of get the data of, of how many autistic people are are in a organization or a, or a department or whatever I do I do quite a lot of um, uh, work for the public appointments I don't know if anyone's aware of what public appointments are if you want to google public appointments vacancies have a look but, um, but public appointments are are appointments where people have a skill um, and then they're they're appointed by ministers of government departments to do sit on boards and 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 oversee things and we we really should I think there should be so many more autistic people on there because you get sent the Nolan principles that's the principles of public life and those principles that you have to live by um, to do any public life work is like um, transparency or uh, honesty leadership accountability um, objectivity and I thought that could just be the autism diagnosis tick box, really, couldn't it? Because we're all very honest um, and, and objective and, you know, have integrity. So, you know, somebody said, oh, I'm going to give you a million pounds to do something which isn't right. I'm not going to do it. Hence why I'm poor. Um, but, you know, so uh, so, yeah, check check out the public appointments. But the, the difficulty we have with the data on that for autism is, um, you know, not not everybody um, considers being autistic being a disability and and the, the tick boxing has to be in line with the office of national statistics and the office of national statistics has to be in line with the census and that is you know there isn't a tick box for neurodiversity or autism it's just are you disabled yes or no so we don't really have the data there anyway to but we can you know try try and make things better but interviews as well the irony is 
I interview people for really important jobs as, as one of my roles. I cannot do an interview at all. I'm awful at interviews. I despise interviews. There are so many other things I'd rather do than do an interview. Um, I never really understand if the context of the questions, I ask for questions in advance. So if anyone is, is looking to do interviews soon, that's a reasonable adjustment, which I found helpful is to ask the interview questions in advance. But I also kind of need the context as why those questions are being asked and in what context should I answer? So, um, you know, sometimes there's an interview question, which is what's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Oh my gosh, I did this in one interview. I was there for absolutely hours telling them all my life story because I thought they wanted a really honest and authentic and transparent answer. So I didn't get that job, but, um, but it, it, can be, it can be quite tricky to give an, to give examples as well and things like that. So interviews, interviews can can be pretty shocking. I think a better way for employment would be for us just to have open days. Um, that would be quite good, just to have an open day for a, for an organisation and get to get to meet people and uh, and see what the job's about and talk a bit about what we do and then take it from there. So like interviews are are not fun. Um, what else have I put on there? Reasonable adjustments. So yeah, interview. Oh, oh, eye contact. I've put on the, the thing there. Eye contact and body language. So I can remember interviewing for, uh, so I was on the interview panel interviewing other people. So <laughs> the difficulty with that was um, the, the job we were interviewing people for were kind of your kind of ex semi-retired Sherlock Holmes of the UK type people. And, uh, and one turned around to me and said, oh, um, well, I can tell I'm, you know, I'm not going to get the job because of you're not looking at me. So at that point, I had to say, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, sorry. I wasn't being rude. I'm autistic. So um, if I'm looking down um, and, and not looking at you, and I'm, I'm giving you my ear because I'm really interested because obviously, I mean, I don't know about anyone else, but is anyone else here with their eyes? I was here with my ears. So, um, so I, I, I apologised because I felt like I was being really unprofessional. And then he said, well, I can still tell you're still fibbing because you're looking downright. And that's where the expression downright liar comes from, because apparently when we lie, we look downright. And I thought I must just look really shifty in life because I'm always looking downright. Um, it's because it's to avoid, or avoid eye contact or to listen. Um, and I thought, gosh, I'm really glad that I'm it, the, the table wasn't turned and I was there for a job interview. because they're going to think I'm a really shifty liar that's not interested and then the penny dropped even more and I thought, what, but these kind of are detectives and stuff. What if I was up on a murder charge <laughs> and they were kind of uh, assuming that, that I was lying immediately. I, you know, I'd be in jail for something I didn't do probably. So, um, so that really, really worried me. That really worried me. And another reason for us to kind of own our diagnosis and, and share it where we feel safe because people just kind of, misunderstand us all the time don't they um so yeah do, do we disclose or not i think that's a tricky one in employment if we don't it's kind of a double-edged sword isn't it if we don't disclose that we're autistic to our employer or potential employer then they may not understand what reasonable adjustments we need for that interview to get the job in the first place or to make us comfortable flourish and successful in the role itself the other issue to that is you <laughs> with guaranteed interview scheme which is good so if you if you meet the minimum criteria you're guaranteed an interview um sometimes you can end up getting interviews for things that, that you're not getting the job um and and also once you've told them if you do get the job and i don't know if it's just me that feels like this because i get quite insecure but you think to yourself did i get the job from talent or did i get the job from token because, oh, it, you know, it would look really good if we had some more disabled people. <laughs> it would look really good if we had another autistic person. And, I, and that, I, I sometimes, I mean, I have no choice because my whole CV is autism. It's very obvious I'm autistic. But, um, but I do sometimes wonder about that, um, which, I, which is probably just really, really silly and, and me just beating myself up. But I, I do sometimes think to myself, oh, I wonder if I got that because they wanted an autistic person or they or I got that because I you know I was the best candidate and uh yeah maybe that's just me being daft but I, I I do worry about things like that I'm not really selling this diagnosis malarkey now am I <laughs> um probably oversharing again 
so yeah thinking about safe garden again and and the struggle of um, locating a nice guy so uh, as you can see here on the on the slide i've i've put like a little meme of saying first we get a dog then we say no more dogs then we get loads of dogs i probably should have updated this for two reasons one um unfortunately i no longer have a dog he died <clears throat> he died in may last year so 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 that's quite sad and also um uh, just on a personal note after living alone for 14 years um and and being single for nearly a decade i have met someone really nice so this is probably a bit outdated but i'm gonna have a rant anyway I, i'll just rant from previous experience so um you know what is flirting um that's a, a bit of an enigma i think for many of us autistic people so that not only can be a bit tricky for us if we are looking to date but it can also be quite tricky for us in a, in a safeguarding way when we don't understand that someone's flirting with us then we carry on a friendship thinking that it's just a friendship and there's nothing more to it and not actually realizing what we're getting into um the context in dating you know if someone says to you do you want to come upstairs for a cup of coffee and it's kind of two o'clock in the afternoon it's, it's normally a cup of coffee but if somebody says oh do you want to come upstairs for a cup of coffee and you've just been out to a cocktail bar and it's 2 a.m in the morning it's, it's normally not coffee I mean where is this rule book <laughs> that other people seem to have so you can end up getting into situations that you might think oh that isn't what I predicted or that I didn't understand the context of that um so yeah that's, that can be a bit of a, a bit of a minefield understanding those very commonly used metaphors I once oh gosh not embarrassing for me, so don't get embarrassed, but embarrassing for my 25 year old. We were in Sainsbury's uh, one Saturday and uh, we were planning just to stay in and watch films and chill out. Um, so we're getting, you know, wine and popcorn. And, uh, and I said, oh, yeah, do you want to Netflix and chill tonight? And my 25 year old is not autistic um, that we know of, um, said, uh, do you have any idea what that means? And I said, no, I, I just thought it meant staying in watching Netflix and chilling out and they were like no that's like a slang term that people use to um to kind of uh you know say do you want to come over and watch films but really they have an intercourse and I was like well first of all I'm really sorry I said that to my daughter um second of all um I, I, um, you know the cogs my head started going and I thought what if what if it was a autistic lad of say 18 19 and he went to a film club he went to a film club with a with a not autistic girl of 13 or 14 and he texted her hey come over and netflix and chill tonight is he going to end up on some register because they think um, being inappropriate that worried me and then i thought about it the other way around as well you know what if it's a autistic girl who's underage and an older not autistic man I said, oh, you know, if you want to Netflix and chill, knowing exactly what that means in street jargon. And she's like, oh, yeah, I love films and, and I love relaxing. Um, and then they have consented to something which is completely illegal. And I, I really worry. I really worry about those sort of things. Um, I like to worry. It's my hobby, by the way. I like to wake up in the morning and have a worry. A day without waking up. A day without a worry is a day wasted. But I do worry about that quite a lot. So um, I also find that, um, and again, you know, it, preaching to the converted, many autistic people aren't necessarily completely straight, either gay or perhaps bisexual or um, demisexual. So where you kind of are attracted to somebody's mind and an emotional connection rather than physical appearance. So, you know, all this kind of Tinder stuff where you have to just look at someone and make a decision where to swipe left or right feels really alien to me um, I never really understood all of that and I didn't really understand the appeal appeal of that at all um, but I am old as well so maybe it's just because I'm old but, uh, but those kind of things can be quite tricky um, and I've also found um, from many of the autistic people I've met over the years the autistic adults we tend and I, I'm, I say the word adults here because I'm about to talk about age gaps so of a consenting age um, I tend to find that age gaps seems to be quite a common thread um, perhaps because there's a purpose to the conversation so if somebody's um, younger than you you can end up you're kind of more the the teacher role you're able to kind of share knowledge 
and if somebody is a lot older than you you can almost take on that student role and and absorb knowledge and it feels like really per it's a there's a good there's purpose to it um and and i see that quite a lot and that's fine when people are you know uh older and, and consenting adults but it's it, it's a worry for autistic teens particularly if they're if they're you know dating much older people historically i've always dated people older than me um and it doesn't matter because i'm in my 40s but when when i was kind of 14 and you're dating someone kind of 12 years older than you that's it's not safe so it's something to kind of for us to be mindful of i think when we're trying to protect younger autistic people and ourselves moving forward and other people be, can be quite judgy about it can't they every time you see a, a woman dating a much older man on tv or in the news people tend to kind of go oh what a gold digger or this that or the other but actually no they might just be autistic um in my opinion so the next slide is the struggle of gaining life-saving health care. So we know, and I hope I'm getting these stats right, that um, autistic life expectancy, average life expectancy is much less than the general population. So if you're autistic with an additional learning disability, um, it's 39.5 years of age, I think is the average life expectancy. And I think, I'm just calculus here, so I muddle up, muddle up my numbers, but I think, it's 54 um, if you're autistic without an additional learning disability. Um, and the reasons for that are, are, are wide and varied, suicide being a big one. But, um, but I think that there's many reasons behind that. So one of my uh, jobs, which I do two days a week, or two and a bit days a week, um, is I've, I work at the NHS in London as a co-production lead um and trying to get as many um nhs uh projects um to be as co-produced by autistic people as possible um because we need people to understand autistic people um in order to safeguard our lives be that our interception so we talk about our sensory issues, don't we? And normally when people talk about our sensory issues, they talk about the bright lights, which I hate. Um, I live by candle lights, um, bright lights or, or noises or things like that. But actually our interception, understanding what's going on inside of us and processing that um, doesn't get spoken about as much. And that can make it really difficult for us to, to know if we're in pain. And some of us can be really hyposensitive to pain, can't we? So really high pain threshold. And some of us can have a really low tolerance, hypersensitive to pain. But that interception, understand what's going on inside of us. Uh, there are so many autistic women I've met that didn't know they were pregnant until much later on. There are many autistic people I've met that have had um, their appendix removed as an emergency surgery, me being one of them. And I think, um, I think I'm... Uh, Oh, I, know, I know it's a bit weird, but often when I meet other autistic adults, the first thing I'll say is, do you still have an appendix? Because <laughs> I'm fascinated by it. Um, before like, oh, nice weather. I'm like, let's talk about appendix. Um, that would be to do with our interception issues. And sometimes forgetting to drink water um, or under eating, not feeling hungry or overeating, um, or often feeling hungry. So that can, that can lead to some health issues. Um, and yeah, and I know many autistic women that have given birth without using any pain relief or may not have known that they were that they were in labor until much later there's a program isn't there that called um oh, what's it called i didn't know i was pregnant and uh and every time i watch that i go oh, i think that woman might be autistic and there was one that was at a harry potter convention so i'm convinced that that one when you just gave, gave birth at harry potter convention so i was convinced that must be one of us um, kind of noticing my my tribe there but it's really difficult for us to be able to express our pain or understand it's happening uh, to begin with, I think, for some of us. So, so that's a worry. Um, I think there's also issues for women with cervical smear uh, uh, screening, so smear tests. I, I was one that put it off. There's, it's a mixture of kind of trauma and um, and the fact that it's just sense, not nice sensory wise and really, really putting it off. So I put it off for about a year over. So it would have been four years, so a year overdue. And then I, I thought, right, I'll pluck up the courage to go. And the way I'll do this is I'll live tweet it. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that would help. I thought if I 
and then I'm not going on my own, am I? Because I, uh, I'm taking the whole of Twitter with me for my smear test. So by live tweet, I mean, I just put pictures of the room, not me, of the room um, and, and the equipment and kind of did tweets whilst I was going through, you know, the getting ready and the going and the afterwards. Uh, so my lack of social imagination <laughs> or my difficulty with social imagination, I just kind of thought it would be fine. So I would just do that and that would be fine, that'd be it. And then it'd be something really good to help other nervous autistic people go and get their smear test or whatever cancer screening test that might be regarding on gender or body parts and uh and anyway so it came back really bad so i had something called cin3 which is um quite well severe high grade abnormal cells so then i had to go through treatment i thought i didn't even think about that i just assumed it would be fine i didn't even think that i'd then have to carry on this thing that i'd started but i'm i'm, I'm okay now um but i'm really glad that that I did that actually because a, it helped and I then had to go and have the treatment done because I could still live tweet to take my mind off of it. Um, but also um, lots of people got their smear to tests booked in. So, so that was good, but it's another struggle for us, something else to consider, um, you know, how do we get abnormal cells often through a HPV infection? How do we get that? Um, we get that because we haven't had the injection for it. Why haven't we got the injection for it? For women my age, it didn't exist. But for younger girls now, normally rolled out in the educational system, loads of autistic girls are um, not in the full time educational system. So it's just seems to be a snowballing layer upon layer of of issues for for us in healthcare as well. So the last one there, I've rambled at you for a very long time, my apologies. Uh, but uh, the last one, there is some contact details. I'm hoping that they're still the same. Um, yes. They are, but it's been, I'd love to, um, I'd love to talk and take any questions that, that you might have. And I hope I didn't ramble that too fast or too slow or just too intensely, but it's lovely to be with you. Thanks very much, Carly. Um, there's been quite a lot of chat gone on. Um, one thing I'll, I'm going to sound like a big head now. I don't mean to be, but you know, what you said about what is the long word for face blindness. Um, because I'm in love with all things Greek, as everyone knows, it's close off agnosia. And it sounds really posh and really complicated, but actually it's just two words in Greek, so face and knowledge. So oh, these, really? it's really, really simple in Greek. So it's prosop agnosia, prosopol is the face. And if you think about gnosia, it's like knowledge. It almost sounds like the word knowledge, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so that that's... That. The other thing I noticed on the chat was um, some people saying they were brilliant with faces but couldn't stand their name being used. So first of all, it illustrates, you know, that we're all individual here and, you know, some things are important to some and not others. But I wondered whether you felt, I don't know if you've read Donald Williams stuff about social exposure. Yeah, and I wondered whether that drawing attention to someone by using their name, it's almost like, no, you just exposed me socially. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I just wondered what you felt about that. I um, I quite like it if someone says my name because sometimes I don't know if people are talking to me or they're talking yeah. to the group or if they're not yeah. talking to me. Yeah. So I, I personally like it for that, but I do understand that you kind of feel like you've been put in a spotlight yeah. um that that kind of intense feeling as well but yeah I I think I was on um it's not like a talk about whatsapp groups now I was on a whatsapp group once and uh the, it was a whatsapp group of lots of women and they were talking about a hen party so I thought oh that's nice to be able to hear about but I didn't think I was invited because nobody had said specifically Carly you know you're invited to this hen party yeah. so I just thought I was yeah. added to the group because they wanted to show me the pictures or something. So, so sometimes I like it if people say my name and so I know that they're talking to me, not just talking around me. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I do understand that kind of, if your name's suddenly called out, it can be like, oh, yeah. you know, what's the expectation? Yeah, what, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. yeah. Carly, can I see if there are questions in the room? Yeah. yeah? Anyone got a question? Yeah. 
Tony, I was fascinated to hear about your uh, safe carbon work. Um, I am following my own episodes of bullying and particle neglect. I've become involved in the Church of England safe carbon as a survivor representative. Um, in particular, um, I was very concerned once I began to do this to find that in no Church of England policy and safe carbon is there any mention of and diversity conditions of which the most relevant to the same carbon practice is probably um, autism and ADHD. Um, I've been trying to pursue this uh, with the recently appointed um, head of national state carbon too, who has a central work on it. It's disappointing actually that my initial email was ignored. So many people myself was closed as recently diagnosed that the victim with multiple episodes of bullying. Then I got the offer from the appointment to discuss the policy. Um, now, I was wondering if you would be um, perhaps able to share um, anything relevant. Um, I'm quite happy to follow up with you uh, by email or, or through to direct message. So I would love to be able to share with you um, something beyond my own knowledge, which is pretty good. Um, on autism and safe farm. But this really is a perfect context. Um, by the way, it might be worth mentioning um, that uh, I'm going to be cleared. Is it the opinion that um, the church and violence are completely unsafe for autistic people? That was this comment on my own experiences that church and violence are completely unsafe. Carly, how much of that could you hear? It, um, I could hear, and hello by the way, um, I could hear um, about the Church of England and safeguarding policies, yeah. and I think what I heard, it was a little, it came in and out a bit, was yeah. about um, there not being anything about autism and ADHD, anything like that, Yeah. Um, and that's as far as I could piece together. Sorry, it's it's just because it's um, going through two, two microphones, I think it kind of yeah. came in and out. Yeah, so this is the first time, Kylie, that we've done a post-diagnostic support group like this. And yeah. uh, obviously everyone's done their best and there will be yeah. learning from this. Um, but so my understanding was exactly that, that and around bullying, around abuse, and that sometimes um, church communities can not maybe be the safe places that people might have anticipated they were. Not always. I've also heard of some church groups that have been very supportive. However, yeah. if policies aren't including that. So I think the question was, would it be at all possible to contact you if you have any advice around this? Yeah. Would that be yeah, acceptable, Carly? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I think my email's on there. I'm really slow at emails, to be honest with you. Um, not because I'm being lazy, but because I just get really overwhelmed um, with with my job roles. But yeah. um, but I'm hoping that in the book there's. I'm not trying to flog the book, I promise. But I've I've written about lots of different safeguarding bits there um, for lots of different kind of situations, and there's lots yeah. of case studies in there that might be helpful. Yes, but if if there's something really specific. Um, feel free to drop me an email that's fine but I just apologize if I'm a bit late for them because I am um, I really struggle with keeping up with emails um, and, yeah. I, and then I feel really rude but um, but I absolutely do try my best yeah I, I know I, I think that's I'll give a copy of your book to that thank you. individual thank you Any thank other you questions from the room okay were there any questions coming up on the chat that I've now missed because I can't see them? Or well, you can't see it, so I'm looking at the wrong person. Any chat messages that have come up? Not very fast. Border collie scale. Oh, oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, is that your dog? Is your dog a border collie? <laughs> so yeah. the border collie scale was something I came up with because um, just as a, a bit of fun, really. Um, it was on the dating slide, wasn't it? That I'd, I'd learned a lot about love, unconditional love, um, from from owning. Uh, it was he was an assistance dog, our border collie, and uh, so the border collie scale was kind of the the bar I was going to use for all all dating. 
that you know I wanted them to be really loyal quite hard working but not yeah. <laughs> um, and there was there was a scale of is this person a border collie or are they more bitch on freeze and just got to get under your feet um so <laughs> that, that was my border collie scale which I sent to my mother thinking that it was funny and she said that I was being um sexist to men so <laughs> So, so yeah, I probably that's I think I should have probably taken that one out. But yeah, it was a it was a way of you know I I found it very very interesting uh, when having an assistance dog, not only when he was helping us as a family, but also in that that downtime and and I I learned an awful lot about about kind of unconditional love from owning a, a border collie. So I'd recommend it to anyone, but I, I lost about three stone because they need walking four hours a day. Yeah. So uh, some people kind of say, oh, you okay, you've lost so much weight. I'm like, no, I just owned a border collie for a few years. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you don't get to sit down very much with them. But if you like walking <laughs> and, you, and you want something that's going to give you complete unconditional love, I can recommend border collies. <laughs> so Carly, what I'm going to do now is suggest we have a 10, sort of 15 minute break. And then if everyone wants to come back in 15 minutes, um, if anyone has any questions uh, over that time, that would you still be able to answer them, Carly? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so lovely. what time should I come back online then, Linda? At about 25? 25 past. 25 past. Come back at 25 past. Okay. So virtual people imagine you're having a cup of tea or a mint imperial with us we've got mint so imperial oh. can you imagine yeah. the mundanest thing possible <laughs> excellent do that <laughs> and so we'll see you at 25 pass <laughs> thanks carly okay see you in a bit carly can you hear yeah okay so we've had a lot of really positive feedback about um you know, saying how amazing you are, etc. I'm sure you've heard that before, but we'll continue to say it. Um, Thank you. I've got one question, which is nothing to do with what you were speaking about, but I think we could get consensus from the group. Somebody's asked me about noise cancelling headphones. Now, I'm aware some of these are incredibly expensive and some are better than others, and we haven't got, I don't want to promote one particular brand or yeah, another, but from your personal and other experience, Carly, have you got a recommendation of noise cancelling headphones? Well, do you know what? To be honest, I just wear, and it's probably really bad for my hearing, so don't take this as medical advice. <laughs> I tend to just wear the blue, uh, the Bluetooth headless, you know, wireless yeah. headphones. I wear those for trains, but then, of course, you can't hear what anyone else is doing. Um, I, I know some people have some really posh ones. Yes. But um, but there are these ones that you can get that look a bit like a ring in your ear. And I've heard I haven't got any of my my own, but I've heard they're really good um, for, for cancelling out noises, but still be able to hear stuff. Yes. Um, and I, I don't know if anyone else struggles with this, but I, I struggle hearing other people eat. Yes, it's just um, the person who was talking about it was saying that they really struggle with people eating near them. Yeah. I've seen some um, on social media. I'm sure they're probably cheaper, not from the brands that are advertised on social media. Yeah. It's just like a little, um, almost like uh, a rubber ear plug that you might put in, but it's got like a hole in the middle. I don't know what they're called, but um, I think I've, I've heard good things about those as well. But yeah, I tend to just whack my music up. It's two reasons. Public transport, you can't hear people eat because sometimes people eat on trains, don't they? Because I have to get the trains on a lot. Um, uh also blocks out all that noise and screech of of trains when they make that eh, 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 that's yeah. quite annoying for a couple of hours a day um and also people don't tend to make conversation with you if you've got your headphones on so sometimes i have my headphones on without any music in yeah. particularly <laughs> i know that makes me sound really antisocial, but then no one tries to strike up a conversation yeah. I, I get quite overwhelmed by that okay thank you so Chloe has now got some quite a few questions from our, which is great, from our virtual people. I hope we're going to be able to answer them. So yeah. Chloe, over to you. Um, I hope you can hear me. <laughs> uh, so we had a question. The presentation covered a lot about how vulnerable we are being autistic and some of the scenarios we laid out, for example, at calls and as parents, etc. 
Could you talk a little bit about how to identify these vulnerabilities and how we can begin to ask for help or to protect ourselves in these situations if they arise? Yeah, I mean, I've put quite a lot of strategies in the book, but if I had to pick one, which is really cost effective, really cheap, um, it would be to ask someone, be it a young person you're supporting or have someone ask you it or another autistic adult that you love and care for. Just every day ask them what was the best thing that happened to you today and what was the worst thing that happened to you today? Because what we tend to do is go, oh, how was your day? Mm. And I do it. And people might just go, oh, that was great. So, for example, let's say there's um, someone who's really, really good at science and they were at school or college or uni or work, wherever that may be, and they got an award for something they did. So you, they come home and say, oh, how was, um, how was school or how was work? And they go, oh, yeah, it was great. I got this award for one of my things that I love, in this case, science. But actually, on the way home from work or the way home from school, they were mugged. But they've just gone, yeah, it was school was great because you asked about school, but not. And how was the journey home and what happened here and what happened there? So um, so I, I think just checking in, either have someone check in with you or someone that you love and support and just say, what was the best thing that happened today and what was the worst thing? And then we can build up a picture of what that day might have been like for them or they can build up a picture of what that day might be like for us. And just to do that every day rather than it being kind of all oh, that sit down and talk about this because that can feel a bit like oh first of all I might not know that I need to do that and second of all it might think I might think it like oh it's a bit intimidating and I feel really uncomfortable but just you know asking how well, the best thing and the worst thing about someone's day every day um, I think can can be a really good safeguarding tactic um, another one is uh, the emoji passwords you know we have emojis on our phones uh, you know, smiley face, sad face, apple, pears, all, all sorts of things, aren't there? To pick one that you rarely use. So I always use that one that's like a smile with hearts around it. I use that all the time. So that wouldn't be a good one for me to use. But I rarely send an emoji of, I don't know, an apple. So that if you're in a situation that you want to get out of, but you don't know how to get out of it, you can just send that emoji to someone trusted and someone who's reliable as well and is actually going to try and get you out of the situation which means you know I want to leave I don't want to be in this situation anymore I don't know how to get out of it so then when that person gets that emoji whatever that might be they call you and they make up an excuse why you have to come home immediately <laughs> so you know if that was a partner it could be oh there's a leak in the kitchen or oh this has happened or oh your mum's just turned up and you should really get home so don't you know see her often xyz um, and if that was a child, you could be, you haven't done your homework, but you know that you have to do the agreement beforehand that it's going to be a fib. It's just you a way of finding out where you Pardon? Oh, I, I didn't hear, I didn't hear the, um, what was said then. But yeah, an, an emoji password can be a really good way of getting out of a situation because sometimes when you're in a situation that you want to get out of, it might be that, it's not safe to say I want to leave that's going to make you more vulnerable yes. or it might be that it's just too awkward I tend to say yes a lot and I say yes because if you say yes to someone they're happy and they're pleased and, you, and you've done the right thing if you say no you then have to come up with reasons why and you then have to have a whole conversation about why it's a no yes. so I, I tend to just say yes 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 and I don't really realize what I'm saying yes to a lot of the time so um so yeah, sometimes I want to get out of the situation. It's it's good to have the emoji password with a few trusted people that you know are going to turn up. Well, next question. Yeah. Um, are there any books, podcasts, videos that you'd recommend to help with demasking and dealing with learning self confidence? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So Helen Ellis, um, and Felicity Sedwick, um, have a book called um what's it called is it's, if you put in Helen Ellis masking book really 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 good book on masking um and that's on Amazon uh, I can't remember the full title of it now it's probably autism and masking um but it, it's a very very good masking book um which which is good for that Rebecca do if we're thinking of younger people but to be honest I might even fill it out myself let me see if I've got it it might be in front of me it might be in front of me no it's not it's over there it's just released a book on Tuesday called all autism identity and me so it's designed for young people over 10 
but it's a workbook that you can fill out about um, uh, what what kind of your brand of autism if you see what I mean how what being autistic is like for you and then talking about other people and things that you might come across but it, that's designed for for much younger children but it looks really good I was tempted to fill it out myself as a bit of um kind of self-esteem self uh self-awareness but no that's that's designed for for younger children um but yeah Helen Ellis's book on masking is brilliant brilliant oh thank you so much Gemma's put it in there autism masking how and why people do it and the impact it can have yeah, that's uh, Helen will never forgive me for not remembering the full title. She's my friend. <laughs> but um, Helen's book on masking, I call it. It's very, very good. I would say as well, um, the first episode of Chris Packham's um, yeah. documentary, when Flo talks to her mum about masking. I yeah. think that's really powerful. Yeah, brilliant. Um, do you have any advice for adults diagnosed late with autism in helping older parents understand that autism is so much more than the 80s stereotype? Yeah. Oh, gosh, the million dollar question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, wish, <laughs> I wish I knew the answer to that. It's, I think generationally it's hard, isn't it? Because um, perhaps our grandparents or parents, if we have older parents, are, um, I've got quite young parents, but... Um, grew up in a really different time where you know you were just naughty or you were just uh, you know quirky um and then no no go for it I was gonna say, I think something Luke said um is you don't have to understand you have yep. to accept so you yep. might never understand what I'm trying to tell you but can you accept yep. me for who I am and it's mm -hmm. In some ways, that might stop a lot of the questions. I, I, however many times I explain this, you may never understand, but please accept. I think that's quite powerful. I, do you know what? I've, I'm sure everyone else in the room uh, has either, ever felt this way at least at once, one time, but it's almost as if the, the onus is on us as autistic people to explain the condition to everyone we meet. Whereas, um, you know, if it was something else, a different disability, you don't have to suddenly become an expert on it to to tell it to, for everyone else and I think also people kind of because aut I mean autism is much better understood it today than it was kind of five ten even maybe three years ago but um but it's it's almost like you have to prove it yeah people say well what how are you autistic or well, you don't look autistic I get that one a lot and I don't know what I mean I think I look really autistic but anyway um but and it's almost as if you have to air your most vulnerable moments or your most uh for people that feel in, in, embarrassed embarrassing moments or or share personal things about yourself just so people believe you and and I used to do I mean you know part of keynoting is talking about that but that's fine that's my job but in in my personal life I kind of came to the agreement that the only person that it matters that believes it is myself and my doctor I don't really so now I don't try and prove it because I used to go oh yeah and this and that and this and that and I thought why am I telling all this personal stuff yeah. about me I don't have to tell them that it doesn't matter if they don't believe me um but but when it's your friends and family that can be quite tricky because a lot of our, our things which we might have told our clinician very personal moments we might not want to share with our with our close family too because it's personal so um so yeah I just just remember if somebody kind of makes you feel that you have to prove it don't they don't have to believe you that's okay I've seen that brilliant cartoon Carly where um one person says to the other person you don't look autistic and the autistic person says but you don't look ignorant yet here we both are and I just think that's really funny anyway sorry over to you Carly <laughs> No, no, it's, it's it's a good one. I wish I had the balls to say that. Yes, <laughs> I would. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. wish I did. Yeah. 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 Um, someone's asked if you could explain a bit more about the advantageous consequences um, yeah. with regards to social imagination. Yeah. So I think um, maybe what I was trying to say there is so if we have difficulty for seeing consequences, um, and not everyone will, but many of us will, in a social situation. So we might not be able to foresee that something awful could happen from this. But also, we might not be able to see that something good can come from it. So asking for help, something good, something advantageous 
can come from it. And also in 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 our careers as well, we might not realise, oh, well, I did this thing, but then I met this other person and then this happened and that happened and now I'm doing this really cool thing. So networking can feel like a bit of an enigma because I kind of think, why is everyone networking? I had, I, I'm not I'm not very good at networking. I, I try, but I'm not very good at it. You know, when there's networking events, I kind of think, oh, gosh. But, you know, there's an advantageous consequence because you get to meet other people that are working in the same field as you and then not literally a field unless you're a farmer, but, you know, in the same in the same job, same kind of job field. Um, and, and, you know, you might get a new job out of it or you might get to meet lots of other people that you've got interesting things to talk about. Um, so sometimes, yeah, networking or social events can feel a bit like, what's the point? Why are we doing this? I don't know these people, well, you know, um, but then you kind of think, oh, yeah, no, that was good because this happened and that happened. So in the same way that we might not see that something disadvantageous, you know, disadvantageous, something bad could come out of could come out of it. Um, it, it can also be a difficulty to see that something good might come out of it, too. So that I've, now that I know that I struggle with that, it's helped me uh get my ass out there and network <laughs> to be honest with you <laughs> as well because you think oh god I'm, i do need to meet more people if i want to you know do this or do that with work stuff or personal stuff but yeah i just kind of thought it was point okay i think this is the last one now um other than providing the questions in advance and holding open days can you suggest any other things employers can do to make recruitment less awful for autistic people yeah, role modelling, I think, helps. Um, they do that quite a bit at the home office. So they'll have, um, you know, obviously they uh, with, with staff that are in agreement to it and happy with it. You know, I think they've got some kind of posters up or um, online posts um, of people that have disabilities that work for various government departments. Um, and I think that helps because if you can't kind of see it, it's hard for us to imagine to be it. We need we need really good role modelling in whatever career um, of of autistic people, um, you know, saying that they they do that job and they like it and 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 they're, they're comfortable in in that in that line of work. I think that helps. I think on a more practical level, um, photos of the building in advance can help if you're doing an in person interview. A short bio and a photo of the people that you're going to meet on the panel on the interview panel can can be really helpful because otherwise we think who's going to be there um and then you know you might just get some names and so i don't know if anyone else does this i'm not a stalker i promise but i, I like google everyone yeah. so i go oh, this is who's on the panel and this is what you know they might come across and xyz and and so i sometimes struggle about thinking oh what am i going to talk about so I think, oh, they're interested in this. So if I learn about this, and before I know it, I've been on the internet for three days, because just because I'm preparing myself to meet new people and I want to be able to, um, to have something to talk to them about, not come across rude and things like that. So there's just so much preparation into it. And workplace culture. So, you know, you get a list of, this is what your job role is. This is who you manage or who manages you, kind of a hierarchy. Don't understand hierarchy. Um, and then... Uh, this is your expected hours of work. So we get all that stuff, but we don't often get uh, on birthdays. This is who gets the cake or who washes up the teacups and, you know, all just like the unwritten rules. Um, I, yeah. I don't, workplace culture. So maybe there should be a little pamphlet just for everyone, not just for autistic people on workplace culture, because that's, that's a whole other language to learn, isn't it? Um, and different companies have very different ways of, of, very different cultures so uh so yeah that that would be helpful yeah that's really helpful thank you Carly. <coughs> any other questions okay so carly i've got a couple of bits of axia business you're very welcome to stay on and listen or equally you've got other things to do but can i thank you very much indeed for a thank you for having me no thank you very much indeed i do urge people to buy the book that's not why Carl is here promoting the book but the book is really easy to read um I think the way you talk about really distressing situations but you do it in a way that it can be read and understood and it's really practical as well so thank you so much for that book it's such a, you know we've got copies here one of the things we like to do is um share you know offer people the chance to 
for our books. You mentioned autism alert cards. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a, our card here for anyone who's been diagnosed by Axio. So we've got autism, ADHD, dyspraxia cards, and resource leaflets and things like that. So, um, yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much. And um, congratulations on your diagnosis, everyone. If no one's congratulated you yet. <laughs> and I hope to have you be at some point soon. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know what the time is because I can't see. Uh, it is The headlines on. Okay. So the headlines are um, we have now moved into our new premises at Brookside Farm Cottage. Mm -hmm. Am I all right to continue? Yes, yeah. yeah. So Brookside Farm Cottage, we've now moved into our new premises. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, such a different place from where we were before. Um, we've still got a few things to, to sort out, as you can imagine, uh, but to say the move's gone without much, many glitches. Um, so I'd like to thank in particular, Bev, Bev Lonergan, who as facilities manager, has managed the most difficult transition that Axi has ever undertaken. So a round of applause, please. The other brilliant news is this year is the 25th anniversary of Axia. So Axia started in 1998. It was myself and my partner, Albert Atkinson, Calvin's dad. And talking to Border Collies, Jim, the Border Collie was the first employee of Axia um, and cured many a dog phobia. Um, so we're, we're thinking of events to celebrate. So if anyone's got any ideas that they want to run past us, we're trying to do a timeline of events. And we mentioned this before at the group, if any of you want to write anything or draw anything um, or a piece of music or anything that talks about how you came into contact with Axia and your experience, of it, it was gratefully received. Um, me, with my help from my niece, Amy, we're trying to write, we're calling it a book, it'd be more like a pamphlet, follow up to my other pamphlet, um, masquerading as a book. So we're gonna try and put together a sort of timeline of events there. Um, Calvin, you've got an idea with your cousin, Joe, who's Amy's brother. Um, regarding uh, there's such a thing as going into too much too detail. much detail yeah, oh, yeah as Carly just that. said oversharing my oversharing no, there's no oversharing you say so you could be inappropriate not yeah. overly detailing things it's not like you say sometimes sometimes I piss in a punch bowl when we go to parties fair enough but okay Carl you didn't have to share that with the crew okay. Anyway, so, um, and also, this is really good news. Um, Luke, um, Luke Beard and Dr. Beard, and some of you took part in his research project, um, because as uh, Luke has always said, this group is unique. There isn't another group like this in the United Kingdom. Um, most groups like this are teaching autistic people social, bloody skills and stuff like that. This group is not that, and it's quite unique, okay? You're here for life. You can't get away from this group. Um, so one of the things Luke's gonna do is present the findings from his research project. And as part of their grant and their ethical approval, they have to present that in a conference format. And what we're trying to do at the moment is look at whether we can combine um, them feeding back the results of the research project with the 25th anniversary conference as well. So watch this space as to how that may or may not emerge. But in any case, this year, Luke will be disseminating the findings from his PhD um, students research project. Okay, thank you for those who took part. The other thing that we'd really be grateful for is the Anna Kennedy Awards are out at the moment um, and nominations can be made by anybody. And there's a group, there is one for a group, post diagnostic support group. And I would really like this group to nominate itself for this award because so many of you put in so much um, 
to either come to this group or watch presentations after. And uh, Dream will be putting some posts around this. Um, nearly finally, the Chris Packham documentaries. There are two, one last week, one this week. Again, Dream's going to put a link on around because that happened this morning. That happened this morning. It's done already. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's the quality of people we've got here. So Dream's already put the link. It's on BBC iPlayer, and I, I think it's two of the best programs I've ever seen. Um, so you weren't allowed on it. I wasn't allowed on it. No, I wasn't invited. Come, no. no, I think we said about one show. Anyway, the final thing that Evie's asked me to say is next time, for those of you who are attending in person, it's in the Lever Hume building, which is way over there. It should be easier to come in. It's as you come in the gate, it's before the car parking man, it's there. So those of you who can't see me on the virtual screen, I'm sorry. And anyone on the virtual screen who wants to come next time will be given instructions about the change of room. So the next group will be the very person that Carly was talking about, our very own. Evie, is it Catriona or is it? Yeah. I thought it was Katrina. I didn't want to correct Carly. Um, but yeah. It's Scottish way, isn't it? It's spelled Catri. That's why I'm asking the Scott in the room. Um, I thought you said our very own, and then you said, how oh, can I pronounce it? Because I had in my head it was Katrina, and then I heard Carly call her Catriona, and I thought, have I got it wrong? No, so Katrina Stewart, um, who works for us, you is. Have to yes, I have spoken to her. She is going to be presenting next time in person, so it will be easier for Dream, much less stress for Dream. And Evie and Chloe in trying to pull all this together. So thank you, everyone, um, and see you next time. Thank you.